working as an educator there, getting a sense um, of the parallels between the, the neoliberal decimation of higher education on an international scale. Um, but that's just one, one, part of, one part of the picture. Um, this panel gives us an opportunity um, to, to think really hard and clearly about education on a, on a broader scale, not just in terms of higher education, but as, um, as a site that has always been a site of struggle. Um, educational institutions can reproduce the worst aspects of capitalism, um, white supremacy, ableism, patriarchy, all of these things. Um, but they always have also been a key site for the growth and development of radical and revolutionary struggle, both through study and through really um, the student struggles, labor struggles, community struggles. So not just through the formal education, obviously, but the education learned through the struggle. Um, and that struggle, um, those fights are, are include labor fights, um, but also fights that extend beyond labor into broader community social movements. Um, and now in particular, um, against the neoliberal policies um, where the defense of um, what we might call like a second commons um, has been, you know, the second commons that has been won through the struggle of workers, students, um, and broader communities, and especially communities of color in the United States. Well, this isn't going to work. The, uh, <laughs> a topic that I've, I've been, you know, really passionately interested in for many years. Um, I think going back to the time when we had to hide under the desks because the Russians were about to bomb us, and <laughs> it occurred to me some years later that that's probably not going to protect me. <laughs> and and um, I, I, I think that they're just trying to scare me. I mean, which is what I, I think that's what it, all, all it was. They just wanted to scare the crap out of us. It worked for a while, and then I discovered the FSP. Okay. <laughs> um, well, uh, uh, you know, you, you, hear, you hear a lot in the news these days about education and um, education reform. They call it education reform. We call it attack, racist attacks on education. But when you, when you see headlines about education reform and you take a look at even what, you know, even some professional organizations, what they're saying about education reform, there's a very curious thing that, that will strike you if you kind of look at it enough times, and that is that it's not really about education. Because if it was about education what you, and, and education reform, what you might see are proposals about how we can reform education based on the current scientific understanding that we have about how children learn and what the best class size is to encourage students to learn and to motivate them and to get them excited about reading and literature and, um, you know, uh, are, are tests harmful or are they not harmful? Um, but that's not what we're hearing when we, or seeing or reading about when we see articles in the newspapers and um, hear head, uh, you know, news reports on, on uh, the TV and radio about education reform. It's actually about something quite different. It, again, if it was about education reform, somebody might ask, how come, you know, a, a week ago, Saturday, May 17th, was the 60th anniversary of Brown versus Board of Education. It was supposed to eliminate separate but equal well, it was never equal. I mean, uh, separate segregated schools, um, they're still separate and they're still unequal. And somebody might, might ask, under education reform, how come we haven't done that yet? The, the ruling class, if they want to accomplish something, they sure do it pretty quickly. I mean, when, when the Russians launched somebody into space, within a few years, the United States had somebody in, in space. If they want to do it, they can do it. It's been 60 years since Brown versus Board of Education. They obviously don't want to do it. Because they could do it, they could do it. Well, what do we read about? Um, well, I mean, you know, uh, I mean, uh, what, what, what do they mean by education reform, and and why isn't it what the let's say the Bolsheviks did, for example, within the first few years of the revolution, it it fell apart um, under Stalinism. But you might know that when the Bolsheviks took power, and the working class in, the, in Russia took power, their education platform included eliminating homework, no homework. 
they, it's true. I'm the, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, it, it sounds so, f no homework? How is that possible? I'll tell you how they did it. They got rid of, they outlawed corporal punishment. They, they said the sciences and the specialized subjects, we'll leave that till later on to high school. In the early years, we take the kids on field trips, we let them see how the world works, we have them explore, discover, and they base that on the latest scientific knowledge about how kids learn. They did it, it wasn't based on a Bolshevik theory, it was based on John Dewey's theory. They, their commissar of education was not a Bolshevik, but they said, who knows the science of education best? Who knows how children learn? Who knows what child development is all about? And they based their education program on, on applying science and knowledge to helping children. Of course, um, many things fell apart, but that's what we might expect if we took a sane look at, you know, if we approached education from a, a, a sane, rational, scientific point of view. And here's one of the things they hand delivered. Well, they didn't, I don't know if they hand delivered this one, but in 2005, another one of the reports, they said, to maintain our country's competitiveness in the 21st century, we must cultivate the skilled scientists and engineers needed to create tomorrow's innovation, to innovations. Our goal is to double the number of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics graduates with bachelor's degrees by 2015. The United States is in a fierce contest with other nations to remain the world's scientific leader. In other words, they want to make sure that the schools and the colleges produce scientists and engineers. Who gives a crap about music, art, physical education? That's not what they need because they are worried to death. They know that they're in a crisis and their plan has been to create a workforce that's gonna keep them competitive with the European and Asian competitors that they see encroaching on their market, and they are worried about it. Uh, and that, Ameri here's, I'm reading a quote from the book, America's education failures pose five distinct threats to national security. The first threat, the most important threat, they, they say, it's on page one of their book, the most important threat is threats to economic growth and competitiveness. We are just not producing enough engineers and scientists. So what do we see in the schools today? They're getting rid of music, they're getting rid of art, they're getting rid of physical education. It's, it's not a coincidence. Where did that come from? This is where it came from. I mean, no educator, no, n not, no educator in his or her right mind would ever propose that we get rid of art, music, and physical education. They, they know that that's, that, when you talk about back to basics, what are the basics for children? Art, music, and physical education. All the science stuff that can come later. I only have five minutes, oh my God. <laughs> so, so the business round table and all these people came up with a plan. Kidnap the public schools, turn them into factories to produce, to produce um, uh, a workforce that they think is gonna save their system. Of course, what they don't tell you is that every other country in the world is doing the same thing. Mexico is testing the kids to death. Europe, they have, the, the stuff I just read you, they, they do, they're doing exactly the same thing. They're, they're all in a, in a race to turn their public schools into factories to produce the kind of workforce that they, they think it's gonna be to outcompete the, the, the US capitalists, and we, th we, you know, the US capitalists think it's to outcompete them. So basically they say, we need to produce scientists and engineers. You'll read in the newspapers about the STEM courses, science, technology, engineering, math. There's no music, art, and physical education. The schools are factories. You proceed along the assembly line. How do you proceed? You pass the test. If you don't pass the test, the schools get closed. The students have no schools. The, 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 the teachers lose their job. The school staff loses their jobs. The union contract doesn't count anymore. Great way to get rid of unions. When you close the schools, you still have to do something with the kids. So what do you do? You tell the, the, the parents, we're gonna bring in private managers. We're gonna bring, turn your schools into charter schools. Now they've privatized the schools. They've man, they, and, and where is this gonna happen? Well, of course, they know where it's gonna happen when they use testing. Testing to, these, to the corporations is what is, they actually say this. In fact, they, 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 as I said before, you can't make this stuff up. They call schools workforce development systems. It's in their literature. Work, that, and their factories, the, the quality control, like, in a, like an assembly line for cars, is somebody looks to make sure the wiring is right, they use testing. You don't pass the test, you're not becoming the engineer we want you to become. Who's gonna fail the test? They, we, educators have known for decades who fails the test. Poor, 
kids in segregated schools that are mostly children of color. Why? No, it's not because they're dumb. Because in Washington, D.C., for example, in the last year, the number of homeless people has increased by 50%. Most are single African-American mothers. They live in abandoned hotels. They have, the kids have no rooms to study. In the evening, their mothers are working a second job. What are they going to do, study for the test? They know who fails the tests. They, they, they know it. This, it's inherently racist. The racist aspect of this is the testing. The privatization angle is the testing. Um, <laughs> there is an organization called Save Our Schools. We're involved in it. We're involved in it because their program is inherently anti-capitalist, anti-corporate. They don't say that capitalism is a problem, but they say this is corporate-based reform. Schools need to be equitably funded not equally funded, because equally funded will maintain the, the disparities. If you give the, everybody the same, no, it's got to be affirmative action. It's got to be that the poor schools have to get more. They have to be equitably funded. <laughs> they are against the testing. They are against the testing because the testing is inherently racist. The testing is the, is the key weapon to, uh, just 10 seconds, the key weapon to to impose the privatization of schools in poor neighborhoods of color. They are trying to destroy childhood by turning kids into workers in training. It used to be that, that you know, if, if you're old, capitalism, well, not used to be. If you're old, capitalism doesn't need you. They throw you away in a nursing home. Now, if, if you're five years old, they, they want you to, uh, to, 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 be, to enter into their worker training program. They're, they're, they're destroying life, they're destroying the planet, they're destroying childhood, they've already destroyed uh, old age. We need to destroy them. Thank you.